Well, hello everyone. I'm back at uh, Kulturhistorisk Museum at the University of Oslo with Professor Mariana Fedler. And we are talking about another subject right now, one of great interest to me and I think of great interest to many other people, which is Norse cooking. So you have written a book, which I should have had ready. Middle Aldrin's Schicken, so the uh, medieval kitchen. And uh, what can you tell us about this book, about what your sources of information were about this? I think that's particularly interesting. Where do you, where do you get medieval Norse recipes? Mm, I have uh, had so much fun with that book because you have a lot of different sources, both archaeological sources and uh, written sources uh, about uh, medieval cooking. And especially interesting is some um, handwritten manuscripts from the 14th century and early 15th century uh, with recipes. But I have also experimented with a lot of archaeological sources uh, like uh, remnants of food we have found inside pots. So we have analyzed them and found a lot of different ingredients. And uh, the written sources and the archaeological sources are s in some ways similar because none of them tell us how much we should use of each ingredients and how we should make the dish. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I needed to experiment a lot. I noticed that in reading the medieval, the, the manuscript recipes, that it was typically take whatever, where we would say take two tablespoons or take you know, five cups or something. It says just take the item, <laughs> take yeah. whatever it is, butter, what have you, without telling you how much. You said that you had experimented with that sometimes and uh, it took a while to get the It took a while, correct. yes. Uh, so I have tried to make recipes that everyone can use and also uh, to pick recipes with ingredients that is uh, possible to get hold of in a normal store mm -hmm. in, in Norway. Are there some ingredients that are difficult to get in a normal store? Oh, well, yes, some like uh, a long pepper, for example. Have you heard about that? Long pepper? Long pepper. It's a special kind of pepper uh, that is like the name says, long. <laughs> oh. A lot of uh, 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 different peppercorns sitting uh, um, yeah, on a long uh, row. And uh, it's a uh, different flavor, different aroma from uh, black pepper that we normally use today. Where is it grown? Uh, in um, Asia and also I think you can grow it some uh, parts of the eastern uh, Mediterranean <laughs> uh, but it's uh, uh, we don't use it anymore in uh, at least in in Scandinavian kitchen so it, that is a bit difficult to get hold on mm. but otherwise uh, in the medieval uh, recipes there are lots of um, uh, spices like cinnamon and uh, cardamom and um, uh, saffron and stuff that we use in uh, traditional use in uh, 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 the Scandinavian kitchen or the Norwegian kitchen for Christmas cakes for example mm -hmm. but in the medieval recipes they use those kind of spices for fish dishes and meat dishes uh, in a similar way that you can find in um, in the kitchen from uh, some Arabic country countries and from the Middle East in general. Mm -hmm. I found that really interesting what you said about how the culinary tradition it looks like it's not very continuous, right? It, it, it yeah. does not seem very similar to traditional Scandinavian cooking no, today. No, that's that, that's. Uh, Totally right. Uh, so we have um, in a, a kind of dip in the use of, of uh, that kind of spices. Let's say in somewhere between the late uh, 16th and the early 17th century, something mm -hmm. like that. And actually, we don't know 
very much about that, what happens in that time. Sure. And I would love to look deeper into that. But uh, so far, I've been looking into the um, uh, the cooking in the 13th, 14th, and 15th century, mostly. And you said there were two manuscripts that the information mostly came from? One uh, was in Ireland? Yes, there are two um, manuscripts or, or uh, um, yeah, t uh, it's one called um, um, Codex K, and one Codex, Codex Q, <laughs> and uh, we have another one as well. Uh, actually, so we have we have three uh, collections of manuscripts uh, written in Norse languages with recipes, <laughs> uh, and it's not very well known actually. So uh, they are very interesting, I think, to to s to see also because they are telling us a lot about how the medieval people were thinking about uh, ingredients and mm. about food in general, because for them, the food was also medicine. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, I was not aware of these manuscripts. No. Um, I understand the, the, the principle, I think, behind the archeological evidence too, analyzing the contents that are left in a pot and I, I don't exactly understand how you what wh how do you analyze those? Yeah, we have uh, uh, we have been doing a lot of research on those uh, lately, the l the latest four years, uh, and um, it started when I looked into um, soapstone vessels. We have a lot of soapstone vessels. They were very popular uh, in the medieval period in Norway, so everyone had a soapstone vessel. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense because that kind of pots uh, uses very little energy and mm. uh, the heat is um, not sent, uh, it's not just in the bottle, uh, bottom of the pot. It is, you know, you, you warm up the whole pot and it stays warm for a very long time. Mm. So the material is very uh, nice, but uh, it tends to, uh, the food tends to stick a little bit uh, to, <laughs> to the pot, to the inside of the pot. And that's a good thing for us because when archaeologists find those pots uh, some hundred years later, uh, it's still there. Mm -hmm. So it's thick layers of food remains inside these pots. Huh, so so what I have do, uh, been doing is to, um, take out a little bit of that and then I have collaborating with uh, um, a, a guy in uh, France of course uh, he has a laboratory where he has been experimenting with um, um, chemical analysis uh, to separate the ingredients uh, mm. uh, in those pots. So he can and identify particular plants, for example? Uh, yes, sometimes particular plants and also between uh, fish, meat, <laughs> uh, and um, also plant material. But he's also able to see um, if the fish had, has been um, uh, What's what's the name? Uh, if they had been uh, salting the fish, oh, sure. and also um, if they had been fermenting grapes, mm. for example. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of these pots, I found uh, a combination of uh, processed fish and fermented grapes, and that is really really interesting because I was thinking of these pots as porridge pots sure, originally. Sure. So that was uh, a great experience to, to see. And uh, Nicolas Garnier, that's uh, the guy's name, running the lab, he has been really good at uh, developing new methods mm -hmm. for us. When you mention porridge, I, I do think 
as you said earlier, that that's often the stereotyped image that people have of medieval yeah. food. But apparently there is a fair amount of variety, at least in a, a privileged enough person's kitchen. Yeah. Is that what we should be thinking of this as sort of a, uh, probably not your, your poorest person's kitchen, which is probably a little bit simpler, but kind yeah. of a upper middle class, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, uh, kitchen. Yeah, and uh, and that's easy to see from the recipes, Norse mm -hmm. recipes as well, because that's the uh, posh kitchen. Uh, sure, with because wine spices at this time was really really expensive. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, if you should buy uh, uh, pepper, or if even if you should buy uh, things like uh, cinnamon and um, uh, saffron. Uh, that was really, really expensive, but it gets cheaper along the way. So uh, it was much more expensive in the 12th century than in the 15th century. Sure. Well, trade trade routes growing and a greater volume of trade, sure, over time. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. And this is the period, of course, when the Hansa network oh, sure. developed in uh, all over Europe. Sure. Mm. Have you? made all of the recipes in the book? Yes, I have. I have uh, <laughs> had to experiment a lot and uh, sometimes my family uh, liked it, sometimes they didn't like it at all. Seems <laughs> natural. Yeah. Uh, what, what was your favorite or your family's favorite? Ah, uh, they like different uh, stuff, but I have um, one recipe uh, with uh, sort of um, uh, fried pasta and cheese and everyone so. likes that one uh, so I would recommend that and uh, and it's easy to make actually because you just make a dough of uh, egg and flour and then you take slices of good hard cheese yeah that's the one, uh, and you uh, you uh, take the pasta dough around the cheese and just fry it, and that's it. So, uh, but that that's based on a French medieval recipe, not mm -hmm. a Norse one. Uh, but if you would like a Norse one, I, I was thinking maybe maybe share a, a, a maybe a shorter recipe with us, give us a, a sense of what what we can expect here. Uh, yes. Uh, and the book is in Norwegian. Is, is there an English translation or one? No, time? unfortunately not. Well, Norwegian it's is easy to read. <laughs> if you read Norse, you it's very easy to read. Yeah, read yeah. Norse, yeah. <laughs> and it's easy to read. It, you know, for an English speaker, I, pe people just reach out with your feelings. Be like Luke Skywalker with a little thing he fights with the lightsaber and the yeah. Millennium Falcon. Uh. Okay, this is uh, this is nice and uh, simple. Uh, this is a sauce that you can use for a lot of different uh, things. Mm. Uh, made from grapes, uh, and here you have uh, the original. Maybe you can read it. Oh, with a little bit of uh, of Latin, even de salso ad carne serequentas apt. In passing the sauce, to stick the shit. Uh, this is so close. This is uh, so this is also part of what was interesting to me about these manuscripts. This feels more like I'm reading Norwegian than Old Norse. Yeah. Right. Kluflux skalman støtte med du vinbær og salt. Den salsa er godt endag til gos og grønt flask og nota shit. I mean, yeah. like I, I'm not even sh like uh, bouncing back and forth between like an Old Norse and a Nor Norwegian reading. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's quite simple. So you take grapes uh, and crush them with salt, and basically, uh, uh, and then you c you can use um, uh, wheat luck, um, garlic. garlic. Mm. So it's just grapes, salt, and garlic. Crush it together. That's your sauce, and it's very good. Also, t you can put it in stews and uh, have it as a side uh, sauce for things. And the in the recipe, it says it, it is 
good for one day. Uh -huh. But if you have a, today you have a refrigerator, so then you can keep it for a little bit longer. I, I like that it specifies that it's good for goose. Yeah. Uh, what, is, what is green meat? What, grunt flask? What grunt flask. Uh, I think it means um, uh, salted uh, pork meat. Huh, okay. Yeah. Well, we're not cooking Kermit the Frog anymore. No. And yeah, good for goose, yeah. uh, pork and beef, I guess. Nit yes, and, and yeah. beef. So I also have a recipe where I use it in uh, uh, with uh, um, meat from... Uh, reindeer? Uh, yeah, you can use it for reindeer as well. So it's good for a lot of stuff. So you can put it in uh, in uh, together with a lot of meat, but don't put it in uh, fish. Huh. I would say no. Okay. Yeah. Can't find that recipe now, but I'm looking forward to trying some of these. Yeah. Some of them look really good. Yeah. Some of them are. And, and I, good. you know, I'm not a creative person in the kitchen. I don't know if you are, like if you, if you feel like you're a creative cook, I, I feel like I get into a rut where I just, you know, I, I, I get good at making something and I just end up making it eight times a month. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very yeah. unimaginative person. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's that or if it's, uh, you, you have to get confident in yourself and, and yeah. And uh, then I th think you can stri uh, try to experiment with the recipe. Sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, just uh, try it more than once and then start to experiment a little bit. This was the one that I was talking about. A stew. It's a stew. Yeah. So for the first uh, time we have found um, uh, sop of uh, mushrooms uh, from the Middle Ages uh, through Nicola Garnier's uh, um, analysis. So we found um, mushrooms for the first time in one of the, uh, these pots. Very interesting. Is it is it a specific kind of mushroom that it requires? Uh, he can't tell us what kind of mushrooms it is. Mm just these mushrooms. Huh. Mm. Interesting. This looks good. Yeah, this is good. Can I share the oops, excuse me. Can I can I share the details of one or two? Absolutely. Just so we need let's see, one kilogram of probably rye bread. Oh no, that's not I saw bread. <laughs> don't have no, my reading I don't no. have my reading glasses on. That's <laughs> okay. So that's the that's actually uh that's steak. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Oxakraft. What is the Oxakraft? Uh, is that like beef? Like bouillon. Bouillon. bouillon? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm. That makes sense. Four hundred grams of uh, of mushroom, whatever kind of mushroom you want. Mm. Five hundred grams of yellow onion. One uh, portion of the grape sauce that you yes. that you des described, and a uh, a half. <laughs> The metric system is harder for me than the Norwegian. <laughs> 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 the, the half, whatever, DL, demiliter, deciliter, demiliter. This is like the scene in, in, in the movie where they find out that you're not, you know, from the country that you're pretending to be, that you're a spy because <laughs> of the way that you hold a glass or something. And it's because I have no idea how the metric system works. <laughs> okay. So... A little bit of red wine. Okay. Mm. Um, thyme. Yeah. And, and salt and pepper. And then you cut up the meat into big cubes and uh, and and uh, Fry brown them. it. Yeah. And, uh, so brown it well on all sides in a in a pod, right? Mm -hmm. So take out the meat and uh, cook cook through. So cook through the pod. So like cook it all down mm. to to the base with a little bit of water and 
and then pour in the uh, the bouillon. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should have you read this right with me because I sound like a moron. Uh, make the grape sauce and uh, have it in the pot together with the meat. Cook that down, mm -hmm. right? Uh, cut the uh, onion into boats. Um. S slices? Yeah. Slices, like oh. slices. yeah. I didn't know the phrase for that was boats. It's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, put it in the pot. Uh, add salt, pepper, and thyme to taste. Mm -hmm. uh, put it, look it. And cover. Oh, cover put the up. cover on. Yeah. Put the cover on mm -hmm. and let it all boil. Uh, let it all, yeah, boil for about an hour, right? Yeah. So then clean the mushroom and or mushrooms and cut them into small, into big bites. Have the mushroom in the pot and cook it uh, for 20 or 30 minutes or until the meat is completely cooked, right? Completely yeah. edibly cooked. Serve with uh, thick sourdough bread. Yeah. Well, that was also a... Uh, uh, brief demonstration that I can, in fact, read Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You're <doing> good. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I think that was in question, <laughs> but it's probably the first time I've read mm -hmm. a cookbook in Norwegian. Yeah. This is, I, I want to try this. Yeah. It sounds great. Yeah, actually. it's good. Uh, I think it's good. Um, the sourdough bread is uh, not for you, but for yeah, many yeah, other people, so. it's uh, also uh, nice to know that in this period it's uh, like uh, you know the sourdough bread came to Norway in the 14th century probably so mm. um, and so uh, it came with um, the Hansa mm. uh, from uh, Germ the German area because you need um, gluten to make a sourdough Right. Bread. If you're not a gluten-free millennial like me. Yeah. What what kind of bread were they making before that? Was it mostly rye bread? Flat bread. No, uh, the rye is coming at this time. The rye has gluten in it. Uh, but uh, before that, we had um, uh, I don't know what it's called in English. Uh, uh, big oh, barley. 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 Yeah, yeah. And havre. Uh, oats, oats? Yeah. yeah. Huh, and okay. that has very little gluten in it. Mm -hmm. So you d it um, you can bake it, cook it on um, a flat stone. So most people made their bread that way, like flat bread. I see. I see. Almost like a tortilla. I mean, mm. in terms of shape and, and size, right? Yeah. yeah. Round. And uh, so most people didn't have a oven. Huh, sure. I didn't think about that, but that makes sense. Mm. That would be a relatively, probably a, a fairly privileged thing to have. Yes. I had not considered that, but I can see, see how that would be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You probably have a pot and you have the ability to make a fire. So yeah. you've got to be able to make your food that way. Yeah. yeah. Huh. But uh, in most towns, they had. Uh, ovens that you could uh, mm. lend. Okay, uh, a communal oven. Yeah. Interesting. Well, what yeah. do you think would surprise people the most in going through these recipes? I mean, we've, we've already discussed some surprising yeah, details. Yeah, but is, yeah. there, is there anything else you, you think would be? Mm, no, I think the most surprising is the variation and mm -hmm. the, uh, the fact that it uh, tastes uh, something like you would find in the Middle East uh, today, more mm -hmm. like that. But it's combined with local resources like reindeer, for example. Sure. So it's a kind of interesting mix there uh, with local resources combined with a little bit of uh, extra from abroad. Mm -hmm. mm. Why do you think there isn't much continuity between this medieval kitchen and today's kitchen in Scandinavia? What breaks that continuity? That's a really interesting question, and I, I don't have a, a good answer for that. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, something that we have to look into and uh, do more research on, actually, because uh, it has 
some someone has tried to explain it by saying that uh, when the spices get cheaper and cheaper, uh, the the rich people don't want it anymore, and okay. it gets out of use. But I don't I don't buy that explanation. Uh, I think it has to be something else, but mm -hmm. I don't know why. What what? Well, just thinking about, you know, you go to a Sons of Norway meeting today in Minnesota or Wisconsin or something, and you're going to have lefse, waffles, lax, God forbid, sitch drumming. Um, yeah. Know, like, there's certain things that people consider Scandinavian dishes. Yeah. And that's just not much in evidence here, other than perhaps a uh, fairly strong emphasis on, on fish, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is surprising to me. Yeah. Oh, so it, I, it so comes later. Yeah. So the traditional Norwegian food comes sometimes in some, uh, well, like in the 17th century, mm, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, by traditional Norwegian food, we understand like Pepe's pizza and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Right. Like From the nowadays. 80s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 7 Eleven. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much mm -hmm. for talking about this with me. And uh, I am extremely interested in this book, <laughs> The Medieval Kitchen by Professor Mariana Fedler. And uh, I recommend you check it out. It's from uh, Spartacus Publishing. Yeah. So there should be a way to get it in, in North America, even. Maybe at least through like an antiquariat. Yeah. I get a lot of books, pro tip, I get a lot of books from Scandinavia from antiquariat.no. Mm -hmm. Used bookstores and kind of a network of used bookstores in Norway where you can order a lot of books and, and use an American credit card, which is an important thing with those websites. So maybe a possibility. But thank you again for your time, for your expertise, and from beautiful Oslo. We're wishing you all the best. Thank you.